In the previous video, I measured some sensor resolution data on the DJI Air 3, amongst others, high ISO performance. That is important because you need to work around the Air 3's major shortcoming, the missing variable aperture. If you want to know what the 180 degree shutter rule is and how it came about, and if and to what extent it applies to you as a videographer, and consequently how to set up your DJI Air 3 or Mini 4 Pro for best possible results, then stay tuned. Welcome to Kit in the Kitchen. I know I promised to go back to the prehistoric roots of this channel, and I will, but sometimes you just need to get to the bottom of things. And to my mind, the last video left a few important messages dangling in the air. Not good. Let's sort this out. Those of us who aspire to be serious videographers have had it hammered into our heads. The shutter speed in video always has to be twice the frame rate, the famous 180 degree shutter rule. What this means is that if your frame rate is 24 frames per second, the classic cinema rate of olden days still used today, then your exposure time should be 1 48th of a second. If your frame rate is 30 frames per second, you should expose each frame at 1 60th of a second, and so on. Where does that rule come from? And should you follow it as a drone videographer? When the first motion picture cameras were invented, they were sensational new technology. By today's standards, they were primitive things. That's just how things go. A box with two hand-cranked rolls to feed and store the film, a lens to project a real image onto it, and a disc with half of it cut out, rotating between the lens and the film. This made sure the film was exposed half of the time and the other half light was shut out to allow the film to be transported one image further. People found that 24 frames per second was just about fast enough to fool the human eye and make us believe that we are looking at real motion. That rotating disc design automatically meant that the film was exposed for one half of 1 24th of a second, that is 1 48th of a second, as a 180 degree segment of that disc was cut out. Actually, you can choose out to cut a smaller segment. Then your exposure time would be, for example, 1 96th if it's only a quarter. That is what we call a 90 degree shutter. It turned out that not only was this fast enough to look like fluid motion, but also the 1 48th second exposure time created just the right amount of motion blur to look like what our eyes see when things are zipping past us in the real world. The 180 degree shutter rule was born. Filmmakers, partly for good reason, but partly to show that they are not your everyday photographer, don't talk about exposure times, they talk about shutter angles. Today, we pretty much follow that rule without questioning. People who shoot at 30 frames per second expose 1 60th of a second. For 60 frames per second, they expose for 120th of a second, and so on. And that's where things get a wee bit stupid, forgive me. Because, you see, the impression of motion blur does not depend on shutter angle. It only depends on exposure time. This means that motion shown at real-world one-to-one speed in a situation where motion is important should better be exposed at 1 50th of a second or thereabouts. The conclusion is that shutter angle as a concept only makes sense if we film at different frame rates than we want to watch our footage at. Say, 120 frames per second watched at 24 frames per second for slow motion. Then too much motion blur would look strange. Or say, 6 frames per second for time lapse, in which case we may have to give things even more motion blur. Though be careful with that. <laughs> 
Now, should you, as a drone videographer, be sticking to the 180 degree shutter rule in the qualified way I just explained? Answer? Yes, you should, if it comes at no cost. Meaning, if you've got a variable aperture, such as featured by my trusted old Mavic 2 Pro or today's Mavic 3, in that case, you set your aperture to a medium, say, f5.6, f giving you some leeway in both directions. Slap on a matching ND filter to make your histogram show no over or under exposure, and off you go. When light conditions change in flight, you can accommodate this by opening or closing your aperture. But um, what if you are stuck at f1.7 or f2.8 as we are with our Air 3s or Mini 4 Pros? In that case, you need to think a bit more. If you are filming at wide angle, sufficiently far away from moving things, then don't worry about motion blur. It wouldn't be visible anyway. Just use an ND filter weak enough to stay at low ISO, then happily shorten your shutter time to produce good exposures. But what if you want to go closer and you expect some movement? Let's have a look at some closer footage, including motion, that I shot at 1 50th, 1 100th, 1 200th and 1 400th of a second, respectively. I've added a few stills with varying degrees of motion blur. Just watch these and use your own judgment. I think that in most cases one one hundredth of a second, one step faster than the 180 degrees, also provides enough motion blur to appear natural for the eye. In cases where you need to expect motion at closer distance, put on an ND filter that is on the dark side, and then increase ISO if things get darker and you'd run the risk of going below the 150th of a second. Don't go below that, it would look very strange. As I said, a bit more thinking and planning required here. Remember what I said in the last video, you can really use ISO 100 to 800 without worry and ISO 1600 at a stretch. That gives you some flexibility. Now, finally, how do I set up my Air 3 before taking off? I start with the standard clear lens cover. Set my ISO to 200, giving me some space to go down to 100. And then I shorten the exposure time until the histogram shows no over or under exposure. That usually means exposing a bit to the right with EV values in the controller display at around plus 0.7. Using this chart, I then select the ND filter I need. They won't be so finely graduated, just use the one closest. In flight, I would then start with a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second, filming in 24 or 30 frames per second. If things get too bright or too dark, I would adjust using ISO. Uh, by the way, I assign that to the right wheel on the RC2 and the shutter speed to button 2 plus the right wheel. And when there is more light than expected and lowering ISO to 100 doesn't do the trick, I'd go to 1 100th or 1 200th of a second shutter speed. 
If I think I really need more motion blur, I'd have to land and replace the ND filter, but with those initial settings, that should be on rare occasions only. This technique, and the fact that drone footage is mostly longer distance with no need for motion blur, is good enough to, for me personally, outweigh the disadvantage of no variable aperture. Having the 70mm equivalent focal length camera is far more important to me. Having said all that, a DJI Air 3 S or whatever name with the same focal lengths but 20 megapixel 1 inch sensors and variable aperture would be most welcome. Thanks for watching, and I was happy to see all the likes and subscribes from the last time. I repeat, it makes a huge difference. Including the alert bell, I know I said you won't get weekly messages. This is an exception, I promise. Goodbye.